All right, we are now recording. We're starting an interview with uh, Mr. Michael Sudbury. Uh, we are in Oakville at the moment, and uh, the interviewer will be William McRae once again. So let's start with just uh, a few simple questions. So what is, uh, please state your full name. Michael Peter Sudbury. And uh, what is your birthday? The 25th of October, 1930. Which would uh, make you how old today? 84. And where were you born? In Forest Hill, in south of London. Okay. And uh, as a child, what did your parents do? My father worked for, for the Westminster Bank uh, originally, and then for the Clearing House in London. And uh, my mother was, was a secretary for prior to getting married. Okay. And um, you as a child, what did uh, what were your pastimes in south of the south of London? It covers quite a quite a quite a period of time. Uh, <clears throat> originally, uh, I was interested in gliding, glider, glider model glider. The, the, there was a boy next door to me who, who built these beautiful gliders, and I went with him and saw them in, in action. Did you ever and, think of uh, getting into uh, aeronautics? Not really, no. no, no. <laughs> he, he did, but okay. uh, he, he was killed in, uh, in Germany oh. in his 33rd mission. Wow. Which was rather sad. Very sad. But, um, but uh, beyond that, uh, cycling was uh, an occupation that I Excellent. enjoyed. And Me as well. Covered a lot of ground uh, over the years on a bicycle. Yeah, did you uh, ever do some big treks? Yeah, uh, in, in high school, I, in the summertime, with friends, uh, we used to travel around Britain. Wow. And cycle, cycled uh, from Kent to Devon on one occasion and up to Gloucestershire on another occasion, staying in youth hostels, which is <coughs> washing in cold water in the morning. Yeah. Sleeping on, on uh, palliasses, uh, but it was great fun. I bet. Yeah, no, I'm a big, I'm a big uh, cyclist as well. Mm. Glad to see a, another cyclist. And um, when did you start showing an early passion, or did you ever show an early passion for sciences or, or engineering or I always anything enjoyed of this sort? science. Yes. And uh, the family was scientifically oriented, I think, because both my brothers uh, took physics and... Uh, they were older? They were younger. Oh, younger? They were younger, yeah. But my mother was, was uh, very interested in, in science too, which was a contributory factor, I think. Stimulated her interest. And, and what did you like uh, specifically about science? Any subjects or? Well, I had a very good chemistry uh, teacher at, at high school. He, he kept us on our toes and yeah. quite wide awake. We also had a good physics uh, teacher. This is in high school. And, uh, it's often the teacher that uh, creates the interest, eh? Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. And um, so tell me a bit about high school. So you, you, you really got into chemistry and physics? Yeah, the, in, uh, the, the, the British system, uh, you study for, for a, a school leaving certificate uh, for five years. And then if you wish to go on to higher education, then you, you stay for another two years and uh, specialize. Okay. So, so uh, I took, took uh, chemistry and physics as a general one of uh, about seven subjects in uh, the junior school. And then when I specialized for the last two years, it was strictly science. Okay. Chemistry, physics, maths. And you were planning on going into what, at university? I, I have too clear a plan, I, I must say. I, uh, my uh, 
father was said I should make up my mind what uh, career, will, career I should take, and uh, if if uh, if I couldn't make up my mind, then uh, he was sure there was a place for me in the bank, and that uh, stimulated my thinking. Because you, know. you didn't want to. <laughs> That's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I uh, <clears throat> got got the government had produced a, a careers for men and women series series of little booklets and I got, got this uh, series one for one weekend and went through it and divided it into possibles, probables and improbables and uh, <coughs> the, the only three that careers that appealed to me were one, one uh, non-ferrous mining, agriculture and, and oil exploration. And, uh, all in the resources. All in the resources. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, the one that seemed the best fit was the non-ferrous mining. Uh, and when when uh, I finally graduated from high school, uh, I talked to the principal in, about the university, and he recommended Sheffield as being the place to study metallurgy. And uh, I, uh, I got caught. I was fortunate enough to be able to go there and, uh, and uh, graduate, eventually graduated. Uh, the professor of metallurgy, Quarrel, uh, I talked to him about my future and he, he uh, suggested uh, that Canada was the place to go. And I, I had, it appealed to me because we have connections there, we have cousins working okay. in Canada. So uh, um, there was a, a course that was organized by the Ontario Mining Association, uh, summer students, for summer students at that time. And in one of the places that hired summer students as uh, replacements for regular workers when they were on vacation was Falkenbridge. And uh, I got a position there for the summer. Was that? Uh... Uh, was that a summer position after you finished your? Uh... Yeah, I was a graduate. Okay, graduate so you had student. just finished. Yeah. So I uh, uh, very much enjoyed that summer. Uh, what was your job at Dockenbridge? Uh, it it uh, was sweeping floors. And, okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, I, I spent many uh, nights uh, picking wood and steel off the mine belt uh, to protect the crushes mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the, the end of the summer I applied for a permanent position. Uh, I really enjoyed it, I liked the people, I liked the, uh, liked the climate. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you liked the climate? Yeah, no, it was summertime. Okay, <laughs> so you hadn't, uh, yeah. you hadn't <laughs> seen December, January, February no. yet? And then I learned to enjoy that as well. Yeah, good. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. You have to. The people who are miserable during the winter in Canada are people who don't do uh, outdoor sports. Exactly. Or... Who don't who yeah. don't enjoy the snow. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Um, yeah, lots to do in Sudbury if you like winter. That's for sure. So did you apply to uh, what position uh, <clears throat> after the summer? I, 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 I was a... Metal experimental engineer is the, is the title, and I worked out, out of a lab with Roy Lyford. Um, and uh, on on quality control, which was checking the checking the weigh scales and uh, checking the reagent concentrations, and things like that. That was initially, and then I, I got into uh, development work. Uh, we were interested in pyridite separation. Uh, at that time, we were making quite a low grade concentrate, 3%, 3, 3, 3.5% nickel for the smelter. And uh, the, the aim was to, to upgrade that by removing pyridine. So I uh, was involved in an investigation of magnetic separators to take advantage of the magnetic properties of, of uh, pyridine. And uh, so that, that uh, 
that led to the installation of, of uh, mag separators in, in the concentrator. That, that would, you would say, would be your first uh, job? Like your first, first, first I guess, uh, official... Development job, yeah. yes. Okay. And then uh, after that, I, I got involved in the preparation of my backfill by desliming tailings. Prior to that, uh, we had used sand and gravel. It was uh, transported underground by gravity. And, uh, we saw it so uh, the slurry was, was a much more flexible and gave a better quality uh, platform. So uh, we uh, installed this, this plant, which I have a double picture, it was out, outside, and uh, which, which gave certain challenges when we were operating at minus uh, 30 in November, January. Yeah. No kidding. <clears throat> um, so I, I had this, this uh, plant that produced batches of uh, taking fill, and in uh, the right moment, I introduced water into the pipeline underground, and uh, and, uh, and then the tailing fill. And we had that telephone communication with the stove. So that was a very interesting. Uh, Project and and uh, was was the foundation for uh, made possible bulk, bulk mining, mm -hmm. which was the fall. And uh, would you say that's that's one of your most challenging projects, or were there more to come? Well, I've had lots of challenging projects. Yeah. And uh, at this point, who would you say, um, or did you have anybody specific? Um, that you consider your mentor? Well, that came later because okay. I, I, uh, well, <clears throat> after uh, working in the mill for a year or so, I, uh, there was a new concentrator starting in Onabin in the northwest of the Sudbury Basin. And I, I uh, joined, joined the staff at the Harvey Mill to work with Simon up the, 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 the uh, Mill superintendent to get the operation going. And, and so that, that, that was also a very interesting experience. <clears throat> but uh, after a, a couple of years, things were, were settling down to a routine, and I, I was looking for a little more action. Get bored. Yeah, so I, I applied for, 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 to, to the research. Department and, and uh, spent the next 25 years really in RD mm -hmm. at Falkenbridge. And, and the, uh, the chief, <coughs> the senior metallurgist at that time was Phil Thornhill, a man for whom I have great respect. Very, 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 very uh, good scientist and uh, uh, sound knowledge of technology, very critical, critical faculty. Did he teach you anything? He taught me. He taught me. He taught me most of the things. Um, yeah. Well, what would, or maybe not something specific uh, scientifically, but what what did uh, what did you gain from him if you had to remember or pick one specific thing? What what was the big thing you admired or learned from him? Well, the thing he was working on. Uh, one of the things he was working on that was development of a. A, a refining process that would be economic in Canada, because the, the existing process uh, that was operated in the Norwegian refinery, the Falkenberg refinery in Norway, um, was was developed in 1910 and uh, was was uh, labor intensive, involved with a lot of recirculation, a lot of filtration, and so, on. so we needed needed. To, it would be uneconomic to build and operate a plant of that nature in Canada. So uh, one, one of the missions that uh, the metallurgical department had was, was to uh, seek and develop a refining process. And he really worked on that. Um, 
Uh, he, he, that was one of, one of his major projects. Um, we looked at various ferrets options and uh, settled on hydrochloric acid to each in the lab. Develop the process uh, around that. Mm -hmm. And out of um, out of your entire career, um, you worked for Falcon Bridge pretty much your entire professional career. Yes. So, um, so I'm guessing within Falcon Bridge, was there a specific um, period in time or project? Uh, that was quite dis dysfunctional. Any uh, big dis dysfunctional moments in your career? <clears throat> I, I, I depends how you you qualify dysfunctional <laughs> uh, um, moments. I, uh, it could be. Um, I was involved in projects which did, did, were, were not successful. Obviously. Yeah, not necessarily. Not necessarily a project that that failed. Um, you, you know, you tried and failed. That's that happens. But uh, maybe more a project or a group you work with that that was dysfunctional. So unorganized or. Yeah, they 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 the the Nikolon refinery was was. In a sense, dysfunctional. It, it, it was it was a, a great concept, and it was to to, to take uh, pyridite and, and roast it, and uh, use it to uh, a metallic iron with about three percent nickel in it. And the target was the the uh, pipeline market. Pipelines were being built all over uh, Canada at that time for. Transportation of oil and gas. At uh, what time? Uh, what period in time was this? That would be about uh, in the 1960s. Okay. And uh, we wanted to take advantage of this, but there was a somewhat limited market, so we didn't want somebody to preempt the uh, the concept. And therefore, the thing was the, the project was born under a veil of secrecy. And uh, when things are kept secret. There isn't any thorough discussion. There's not scope for questions. And um, while, while most of the elements of the process uh, were, were uh, successful, it did have a, a weak link. And the uh, process is only as, as good as the weak link. Um, it could have been that might have been uh, avoided if, if there had been time and the money and the will to make and construct an integrated pilot plan, which, which uh, could well have brought out these, these deficiencies and, and uh, found a way around them. But, but uh, in, in the interest of time, that was uh, short. Shortcut. So between the secrecy and the, and the shortcutting, the rush, uh, it, it, it founded. It, it failed, failed, failed to see the link, link and. Uh, and overall, it did not work. It did. Overall, it did not work. Yeah. In in in, in retrospect, it, it it would have been an economic anyway because uh, of the oil crisis. So. Sure. The price price of uh, it, it was quite energy intensive. It used oil and uh, uh, coal primer as the primary fuel for reduction, and it uh, used natural gas for reduction of sulfur dioxide to elemental sulfur. And uh, the price of both of those uh, increased in '73, and again in I guess later in the decade, mm -hmm. very substantially. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's a good example, good answer of a dysfunctional uh, project. Um, what would be your fondest memory related to, to work or professionally? I, 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 th I think perhaps the, the um, celebration of, of the signing of the BCO contract 
Of the which one, sorry? The BC, uh, BC uh, Botswana. Uh, no, the, <coughs> there was a, a nickel operation in, in Botswana, and uh, it, it was shipping its uh, map to a company in, in, in North America. And uh, it wasn't very economic. The, 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 cost of, of refining was the map was too high or well, they thought so so we got into discussion with them and and uh, after after a year of fairly intensive negotiation uh, we finally uh, got, got the contract to treat their product production and uh, uh, the, the, the signing of that final contract was, was uh, carried out in Paris, and, and uh, I was with Falkenbridge International at that time in the marketing function. And uh, Sandy Allen uh, was present at the refining signing, and uh, uh, immediately after, jumped on Concord and flew to New York and then to Bermuda, where I, which was our base. Wow, and, uh, <laughs> not bad. Yeah, came to the office and announced this uh, signing, and we had a celebration in Bermuda. In Bermuda, not yes. a bad party. Yeah, well, you you uh, you guys had an office in Bermuda. Yeah. yeah. Did you work there a lot? I worked there for four years. Wow. Yeah. I was involved for uh, for ten years with with uh, Fallbridge International in building up a. Uh, custom feed uh, business. Yes, the the um, backing off a little during 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 this seventies, the nickel industry was not very happy place. The price of nickel dropped to about a dollar fifty, and uh, several of our mines were uneconomic and. Uh, put on standby, and uh, there was very little uh, inadequate uh, feed for those uh, smaller in the refinery, or well, they had excess capacity, and uh, we, we, our fun job was to find materials to f use that capacity, and we were pretty successful. Mm -hmm. uh, BCL was, I guess, one of the big Contracts. A lot of it were, were, were a, a whole lot of little contracts. Yeah. And your job then you said was marketing? It, yeah. We, it, wrong, we called it raw materials marketing. It was the acquisition or the contracting of, of um, to, to, to treat. Okay. So you, out and refine so you would go and try to get contracts from around the world. Yeah, we visited just so about that, every nickel company and, and talked to a whole lot of secondary uh, scrap scrap mm -hmm. dealers. Mm -hmm. Got to know the scrap business quite well. That's been an interesting job. Oh, it was a fascinating job. Yes. Did you? You must have traveled a lot. Yeah, I tra traveled to every continent. Uh, oh yeah. Or, what was your uh, What was your favorite location? Uh, or I like Australia a lot. Australia. Uh, Perth, Perth was Western Australia, a very nice place. I hear. Uh, New Zealand to uh, been there on business. Okay. But uh, they they all have their merits and he merits. Yeah. <laughs> and um, throughout your um, your lifetime, yeah. You worked with the same company for most of your uh, your life, but uh, did you join any professional organizations or committees or things like that? Yeah, I, I, I've been involved with CIN, uh, I guess, from the beginning. And uh, I, I also joined the, uh, the TMS, the uh, U.S. Metallurgical Society, um, <laughs> but then uh, I, once, once I got involved in the uh, recycling business, I joined the International Precious Metal 
Industry Association, uh, uh, Association of uh, Metal Recyclers, and uh, so on. Uh, yeah, you you did uh, you've done quite a bit of work for um, like the the environment and sustainability, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that uh, while, while it was always an element in the R and D look and and also in in the exploration to make sure we didn't get undesirable uh, materials in, in a custom feed okay um, I, I really got involved in full time in, in environment in 1988 when I returned from Bermuda to Toronto as uh, the, the um, to head up the environmental department of the, to the corporate office and, and um, establish a, 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 a clear environmental um, policy policies procedures and, 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 and technology for, too was this for falcon bridge canada or international still this was international hmm. Yeah. And what what uh, what changes or policies did you bring uh, in terms of environmental well, or sustainable? Uh... Um, well, we we support, so, so supported the concept of sustainable development. Um, but we all, the, one of the main tools was was the environmental audit. We did environmental auditing of. of maybe all our operations and, and uh, that, that um, increase the awareness heighten the awareness and, and uh, like i said so uh, all falcon bridge sites had to respect a specific set of standards for the environment and, and you would audit them yes okay yeah. and did you did you um through your work there did you enforce or put in place any any new environmental uh, laws or, or rules? Well, the rule uh, or standards. Yeah, the, the the laws were were, were being enhanced uh, more or less continuously, and I was involved with, with the, the Mining Association of Canada, the Environmental Committee. In interfacing with the government um, on, on, on uh, and, and with other stakeholders on the detailing of these uh, these, these uh, regulations, the regulations to back up the laws. Um, and that, that, that was interesting. I bet. And as um, you had talked about. Um, one of your I guess, role models um, you started working with, uh, who was head of research and development. Uh, he, 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 yeah, he, he. Again, you're talking a spectrum of time, so yes. these things changed quite a bit over 20, 30 years. Um, but uh, if we go back to uh, well, uh, <coughs> Phil, Phil Thornhill. Thornhill. He, um, you said he. I think he was head of. Uh, yeah, he he he, he, he was uh, responsible for the lab in Falconbridge okay. at the time. And then you took over. And then, then yeah, he, he he for various reasons he moved to Toronto, and uh, and so he he and uh, the the uh, VP of metallurgy was Archie Archibald, Frederick Archibald, <coughs> and. Uh, and, and you at that time, did you take his place in R and D? Yeah, in, in Falkenbridge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and did you, while your lifetime there, did you, what were the big projects you worked on, or the big things you, uh, I guess? Well, changed? I meant, just mentioned the refining. Mm -hmm. um, we, we also in. Involved in, in upgrading the small well. And we looked at many, many approaches to that over a number of years. Um, 
mainly focusing on, on agglomeration of concentrate, different ways to, to form concentrate into lumps which would be suitable for the blast furnaces which were the main smelting unit at that time. Um, but uh, none, of, none, of, none of the uh, techniques we employ were, were fully satisfactory. But one of the difficulties, I think, is that the um, concentrates were reagent coated and didn't stick together very well. Okay. And uh, in spite of using different blinders, many different blinders were tested. Um, and, uh, and eventually, uh, we, we, uh, it was decided to move to electric furnace smelting. And so then we, we piloted electric furnace smelting, we piloted the uh, partial roasting concentrate to feed the electric furnace, and Is we piloted the uh, slurry handling of uh, production of the thick slurry and, and uh, transportation of the thick slurries. Okay. Forgive my ignorance, uh, but electric uh, furnaces, is it like electric arc furnaces? Electric arc okay. furnaces, yes. Submerged arc. Okay. I was just, um, I actually just interviewed uh, Mr. Uh, Jerry Heffernan this morning. Mm. It's very big into the electric arc mm. furnaces. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, our first, first uh, electric arc furnaces were in the refinery. Uh, uh, and then uh, the Dominican Republic installed electric furnaces. The, the, the process was based on electric production and uh, smelting of uh, partially reduced laterite. So the, there was a fair amount of technology, but sulfide, sulfide uh, smelting is, is different. Um, we, we ran a, ran a <coughs> two, two megawatt uh, pilot unit for a period of time to get experience with, with, with that. And out of that, uh, really, uh, it was, it was uh, exploiting that that uh, uh, was, was uh, the basis of much of the work that I did when I was with Falkenbridge International, because uh, uh, we, we learned to uh, operate with under reducing conditions, which allowed us to greatly increase the recovery of cobalt. And uh, <clears throat> one, one, of, one of the uh, one of the features here was was the use of uh, copper fingers to cool the furnace walls and, and keep retain the integrity of the furnace uh, structure. Okay. Um, and, um, so, uh, this was followed followed up by Larry Seeley and others in the uh, in the smelter operation. It became a very 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 effective uh, addition to our, our system. And throughout your um, work at Falconbridge, what? Um what were your go-to social activities outside of uh, working hours, I guess, or even during working hours? Yeah, well, uh, when I was in Arnaping, I, I was in the curling and, uh, and enjoyed that uh, in the wintertime. Excellent. Uh, and uh, took advantage of the lakes in the, in the summertime. And then uh, when we moved back to Falkenbridge, uh, I, I teamed up with uh, people and got into sailing on the North Channel and spent several years uh, enjoyable weekends uh, roaming the islands. Wow. Uh, and was that um, hunting in the fall? Yeah, hunting. Yeah, lots of, lots of good hunting uh, in the Sudbury region. What, what was the um, social activity trends uh, for, for most people in, uh, at Falcon Bridge? Was it also curling and hunting, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I would. Wasn't just you. No. <laughs> many, many people. Okay. Um, and were there any at Falcon Bridge, or, or at least in in the departments you saw or worked with, were there any um, recurring social um, issues or social problems like um, alcohol use or drug use or 
abuse, anything like that? Well, there's a lot of partying. But, uh, and and uh, there, were, there, were, there were quite a few uh, premature deaths from heart failure. And whether they, 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 they were related, I don't know. Related to... Uh... A bit of excessive. Uh, <laughs> I hear. Uh, I, I in general, what I hear is that uh, the guys like to to drink, generally. Yeah, when I was in uh, we were at two bodies a week, uh, for most of the year. <clears throat> well, that changed when I oh, yeah. <laughs> got married and moved into Sudbury, and then I got involved in, in uh, junior hockey and uh, playground. Helping with the local playground, uh, developing it. And so, yeah. did you get into hockey when you uh, when you moved to Canada? Did, did you get into hockey a lot once you moved to Canada? Well, uh, through 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 the junior hockey, yeah. Because it's not very big I, in I, England. My, my son was on a on a team. Okay. And uh, with, with the, just the the, um, the coach uh, lived up the street. His sons were in it, and my son was in it. And we, we were all over Ontario uh, yeah. competing, and that was that was uh, very very a lot of fun, and it took a lot of time. Um. Yeah. I. Yeah. Hockey. I was always. Uh, I was never in hockey. I was always a big uh, downhill skier. Mm. But uh, yeah, I hear hockey takes up a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Especially for the parents. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prior to that, I, I I was into skiing too, but not in not very intensively. No. And um, again, at Falcon Bridge, uh, throughout your career, how present or absent were uh, were women in the workplace? And if they were, what what were typically their yeah. roles? There weren't many women women when I started. They were they were. In secretarial roles in the office, so. but uh, as, to, as time went by, there were more engineering graduates than women, and uh, so uh, when I when I, <coughs> toward the end of my career, the, the superintendent of the uh, uh, concentrator was a, was a woman in, in Strathcona, did a very very good job. And, uh, there were also uh, women in, in the uh, exploration field too. So, okay. Uh, the trend trend was well established. Uh, yeah. By the time I left. So it kind of it followed the whatever was produced from university. It it followed at Falcon Bridge essentially. Yeah, yeah. You didn't see too many many. Uh, Women in the operations, so it, the work was generally rather dirty and heavy. So, mm. it's, uh, yeah. originally anyway. They, yeah. they, again, that changed with time. Really, trying I mean, to control them operators. And true, that. true. I mean, it's still still more men today, but yeah, no, absolutely. Um, okay. Um, yeah, we had we had talked a bit about. Um, sustainability and, and your work uh, in the environmental standards. Uh, you actually, I see you won the St. Crude Award for Excellence in Sustainable Development. Um, can you can you explain uh, a little bit or elaborate a bit on the, the work you did to, uh, to receive that? Uh, yeah, I, the, the, uh, how I work was, was sustainability was an integral part of that, I guess. It, it's, uh, um, if, we, if we look at the concentrator, then uh, it, 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 the, the, the challenge was to uh, ensure that we didn't discharge water that was unacceptable, uh, that, that we uh, iso isolated the uh, tailings as far as possible, and um, in that field, I, I think I can take credit for, for uh, promoting techniques uh, at, at Strathcona, which have been quite effective in that. Um, 
we, we took advantage of the periodic separation to, to put the relatively small volume of iron sulfide material underwater. Uh, and uh, we took advantage of the, the fact that the uh, bulk of the tailings was being stored underground to the point backfill, usefully, which just left left a very fine slime product, low in sulfur. And uh, the uh, concentrator installed thickness, to, to, uh, which enabled them to recycle the water right, right uh, on site and, and gave a thickened product which made an excellent uh, cover, an impermeable cover over the pre-existing sulfide bearing tailings. And uh, I, I encouraged that uh, very much when, when I was uh, responsible for the environment. Okay. As, as Director of Environmental Affairs. So that, that was uh, one area. Uh, another area was, was uh, in, in the smelting and the uh, production of uh, sulfuric acid and uh, the, the development of the roasting, partial roasting operation facilitated the production of acid. And it gave us a strong, steady sulfur dioxide flow which the uh, acid plant needs. Um, on refining, that really dates back to Phil Thornhill's work, and uh, I, I just assisted in the investigations there. Um, we, <coughs> we, uh, we, we pioneered the uh, use of solvents for extraction of iron and cobalt from, from hydrochloric acid not leach solutions. And, uh, the, the uh, cobalt uh, approach, the triacyloxyl lamine approach, was adopted by the refinery and, and uh, was, was successful in simplifying and improving the recovery of cobalt in the refinery. Uh, I, I guess the uh, recycling aspect uh, was also a con contribution to sustainability. We, we did manage to recycle a lot of materials. Uh, Are you saying metals and me metals? Yes, um, many of which have been piling up uh, because there, there wasn't an outlet for them. And uh, super alloy grindings was was one of the materials which we uh, were able to process. So, what what would you do with the leftover metals, with the scrap metals? Well, the, the scrap metals were fed into the refinery, into, into the refinery, or into the smelter, depending. To be used up again. And and uh, and the, the nickel and the cobalt and any precious metals in them were, were uh, recovered. <coughs> One of our contracts was was uh, with Rolls Royce in in Birmingham, and uh, <coughs> they 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 um, were. were pushing aircraft, uh, the limits of aircraft engines, and, and one of their techniques was to, to uh, form little channels in, in the blades on the, uh, on the jet engines mm -hmm. through, through which they could uh, flow co coolant. Okay. And, and, and uh, the, the, each of these blades had to be made cast individually and they, they had to suspend little cores in the, in the mold uh, to, to uh, keep these, form these channels. Yeah. And, and the, the, uh, to suspend the, the core in the mold, they found that the best material is platinum. So they had these little platinum pins and, and uh, uh, when, 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 the, when the, the, the mold was cast, uh, the, the platinum got absorbed into the blade and didn't do any harm to the properties of the blade. But uh, they had a lot of defects and uh, they, they wanted to get some credit for the platinum and the defects because the platinum was worth more than the 
<laughs> nickel and cobalt. So we, we, we were able to uh, compete for contract for reprocessing these. And you got them? Yeah, we got them. They were delivered to Fulton Bridge units. Right on. We had, um, slightly, slightly related, um, in our collection, we actually have um, a um, chicken cannon, which uh, was used to test uh, uh, windshields mostly for aircrafts. I don't know if it was used in engines as well, but it was used to test uh, windshields. I always thought that was one of our, our oh, coolest artifacts. Right. Yeah. So a chicken cannon, they used to throw, a, I think, frozen birds usually. <laughs> to the windshield. Not like yeah. one. No, no, no. I'll see they were frozen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, and uh, t could you talk a bit about the end of your career at Falcon Bridge? Because then you moved on to consulting, right? Yeah. I, uh, after I graduated, uh, it was mandatory retirement at 65. Oh, okay. Uh, but they, mandatory. They, mandatory. 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 Yeah, yeah. But the, the, uh, <clears throat> it, it was a year before my re replacement uh, was, was in, could be put in place. So I, I started on, on a consulting basis. Uh, still for Falcon Bridge. Still for okay. Falcon Bridge to fill that year. And then following that, I, I got involved in, in other projects. There was an energy project I was involved with. Uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> doing doing a, a survey of all the operations uh, to, to characterize their energy consumption. Okay. Um, that was one project. Uh, another project which, which uh, took a, a quite a lot of time was uh, Seeking ways to utilize byproduct, mine byproduct, namely tailings and slag. Um, and I must say, we didn't get too far with the tailings. Uh, with the slag, uh, we, we uh, were quite successful in finding people who were very interested in the slag. The price they were prepared to pay was, was, was uh, not high enough in the minds of the legal department to justify the risk of fraudulent lawsuits. Um, so we were, we were stymied uh, from pursuing that. What were the, uh, what would be the anticipated lawsuits? Um, the, 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 the way the, uh, Legal department put it. Um, the Falcon Bridge had a deep pocket, and and uh, there are always people looking to benefit through legal lawsuits from deep pockets. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> uh, under the laws in the states, which was one of our main markets, uh, the, the the laws are such that that. Uh, Anybody can sue you, and it, it doesn't have to be for any good reason. It can be a frivolous, and, and uh, but but by the time you've defended yourself and uh, uh, you've spent you've spent a lot of money, mm -hmm. and and uh, that that uh, money the, the the costs are charged to you. There's no recompense, so. That, that was the, their position, and I, I had to accept that it was valid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we had to reluctantly tell these potential consumers of, of the smell of slag that uh, because of the uh, residual nickel content in the slag that we were unable to uh, supply it, huh. which was a big disappointment. Yeah. Big disappointment. Do you still uh, do some consulting today? Uh, I haven't have them for uh, the last two years. No. Okay, no. so fully retired now? <laughs> um, or not quite? Not necessarily, <laughs> but <laughs> we, we, we've had, had, had uh, some health problems. Uh, 
which which uh, kept me preoccupied. Uh, mm. It's just it's funny because every uh, every interview I have, uh, whether whether the person's eighty four or ninety one or ninety five, they're they never seem to be completely retired. <laughs> They're always working a little bit, at least. Yeah, well, it, it <laughs> keeps your mind active, yeah. and uh, it, it, yeah. it, it is your life after all. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's a, yeah, most of these guys, um, they, uh, their their work is their life, yeah. and you can tell. Yeah, you can tell. Um, what would you say is the most proudest moment in your life? Maybe a tough question. <laughs> yeah. I... Here, we'll, we'll divide it into proudest moment. And then proudest moment professionally. Uh, I, I have, have great difficulty answering that question. Uh, one, one because I, I'm not particularly proud. Uh, <laughs> kind of keep a low profile. And, uh, I've noticed. I've noticed. Uh, maybe okay. Let's change the wording to satisfied what are you the most satisfied uh, about concerning you professionally well I, 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 I probably got most satisfaction from from this uh, building this uh, recycling business it, it contributed very substantially uh, in the uh, early 80s late 70s early 80s to the survival of the company uh, so at least to the bottom line and, uh, to exaggerate, but uh, uh, it, 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 um, you don't have to be too bad. Don't be too bashful. <laughs> it tip, tip, I think it tipped the balance. So okay. It was that extra. Okay. And um, this is my favorite question I like to ask. Um, if you were speaking to me or someone younger, uh, like a student or anybody like that, even children, maybe. What would be the uh, one uh, life lesson or piece of advice you would give them concerning their career or the their future? Well, pick something you enjoy and work hard at it. Pick something you like, yeah. For sure. Yeah, and, and, and give it your best. Excellent, excellent piece of advice. Um, is there uh, anything else you'd like to uh, to add or or share or, or tell me if we've missed something? I, I think you've, you've done a pretty comprehensive job. Uh, so I, I wouldn't, wouldn't presume to. Oh no, it's it's really. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've done so much. So, um, is there anything uh, we didn't we didn't elaborate on, or you'd like to no, share? No, I. I uh, the only thing with, with respect to history is, is, is the point I made earlier that uh, a lot of the written history is, is becoming very hard to find. And uh, I gave the example of the Fulton Bridge uh, annual reports. I tried to, tried to get co a copy of the uh, ones from 1928 to 1955. And uh, I, I, I uh, Check, checked with uh, OMA and with, uh, with the Sudbury Archives, with the company, and uh, nobody, nobody appeared to have, have any copies. Uh, the only place I found them was, was at McGill. Mm -hmm. They had a, had a project there to uh, put, put these rare, rare, rare reports. They had accumulated reports from most Canadian mining companies over the years and they had a project to, to uh, put the uh, established electronic files and, and I think they got up to A, B and C but, but uh, now is it ran out of money before they got to uh, Falconbridge. Yeah. Um, so that, 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 that was sad, sad to know and uh, I hope it will be picked up before the uh, <coughs> paper gets too old and yeah, too damaged. Disintegrates. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Let's hope so. Well, 
Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you.